Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH virtual event space. These two faces you guys might recognize. They haven't been here in a while, but they are no strangers to the event space. So I want to welcome back. You're it back. Is good to be back. It's it's great to see you on the screen here. And now it's something new. It's like we're not talking about light painting. We're not talking about Lightroom. It's like mm. a whole new, I don't know what happened here. Future. So that's it. That's it. Yeah. And thank <laughs> well, you for hosting us in your house, Derek. We're, we're in the room next door. It's it's very nice. It's a great, it's a great space. Thank you. I'm sorry you guys didn't get like the whole studio set up. It's the guest room set up, but <laughs> hey, right. we'll, we'll make it work. But hey, make we're here back. to discuss the future. The future is now. Uh, AI is it's already it's already here. So this is an exciting series, and I'm excited that you guys have stepped into it because mm -hmm. I like when I have a known quantity, a trusted source that can kind of dabble into the stuff that I'm interested in, and then you guys could just give us the abridged version of everything. You can cut through all the fat. We're <laughs> saying give me the cliff notes. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Cliff notes, pun intended. There you go. All right. Well, uh, my dad jokes, that's enough for now. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. I will remind everybody to get your questions in. If you have any questions during the event, throw them in. We'll get them answered during the event. And uh, if not, we'll have the Q&A session after. But Cliff, Susan, great to have you guys back on. I didn't even introduce you. I was so excited over here. I didn't even introduce you guys. But everybody knows Cliff and Susan. I'll turn it over to you guys and I'll see you in a bit from Q&A. Thanks, Derek. Uh, thanks, Derek. We are thrilled to be back here, and we're excited to be talking about a new subject, which is probably the rage. It's all everyone's talking about right now is AI and photography. So we're excited to dive in and uh, and share with you guys what we've been dabbling in. Let's... So this is going to be the first many many podcasts, unless B and just cuts the plug immediately. We'll see. We're hoping this is going to be this, the first of many podcasts. This is a very large and uh, very relevant topic, as many of you know, right? And it's affecting literally everybody at the moment. So uh, we've been doing these presentations in various camera clubs and we do a lot of consulting and stuff like that. And we are like, you know, this would be just the perfect opportunity to reach a larger audience, to speak to the community and say, like, this is something that evolves on a on a day by day basis, literally like day by day by day, the news changes so fast. So this is something that we're intending to be an evolution, right? To to keep people up to date, to keep them uh, in the news and in the know, and to have this evolve as the technology uh, does so. So this will be part of an ongoing series, but it's going to be based upon not just AI. AI is a big part of it, uh, but based upon basically the future of photography, what we call the state of the art and the future of photography. Um, so having said that, there's a lot to cover today, and there's a lot to cover in the future series, but because Derek didn't give us a proper intro, we're going to go ahead and introduce <laughs> ourselves a little bit. Um, my name is Clifford Pickett. I'll just start first because I'm already talking. I'm, I'm at the top there. Uh, so many things to discuss, but basically I have a background in photography. I've been basically teaching and shooting professionally as a full-time photographer for years using my iPhone, right? So I know a little bit about and a very tactile, like a very hands-on, skin-of-the-game kind of approach about what it looks like to use computational photography and leverage new technology and new tools for creative ends and commercial ends. You know, I'm a, I'm a drone pilot. I work with Google and Apple. I'm a professor at, uh, an adjunct professor at NYU. I was a board director for ASMP in New York for several years, and I do consulting, and we do workshops together. So there's a lot of training. There's a lot of education. There's also a lot of application of this technology. And it's not to say that we're experts in this space because anyone who truly says that, I'm not sure if I would believe them. We are learning and growing just about as much as everyone else is trying to, but we are are hyper involved in the space in a lot of levels, in an educational level, in a professional level, in a personal level. And so from that perspective that we want to be presenting this material to you guys and, and activate a community that everyone can get involved in. Okay, I'll just use that. Hey guys, I'm Susan Magnano. You guys have seen us on the B&H space before. We lead photography tours. My company is Photor Adventures, and we do everything from traveling internationally to traveling around the U.S., capturing day, night, even stars and light painting, which is my specialty type of photography. So I'm always looking for the newest technology to improve my photos. So this world of AI has really been opening up my eyes to what is possible. And I'm so excited to share with you guys what we've learned. 
I've been doing this for over 20 years now and, um, and you know, just jumping in head first and feet first into this, uh, this new developments that we have. We want to actually invite you guys all to visit our site that we created. It's called the future of dot photography and not dot com dot photography. Yeah, don't go to the future of photography dot com. There's nothing there. <laughs> go to the future of dot photography. Yeah, don't get confused. Yeah. Um, so if you go there, we actually have a great link for you guys to sign up to our newsletter and get all this content plus more that we're going to be updating monthly or so, or every time we do a session, because there's always new information coming out. So let's dive in. Yeah. So, and it, just one more second. So in that space too, we'll be, um, up keeping people up to date. We'll be establishing a community, right? So there's something to, to look forward to too. And we'll have it up shortly as far as like a membership and people can come in and share their ideas and communicate and comment on each other's photos. It's going to be a platform that people can really engage in and ask questions to the community that we can answer, others can answer, something that we can take out of this presentation and allow people to really engage. So you're not just waiting for the next episode, right? We really want to give you a platform that you can engage with each other into. So definitely check that out, the future of dot photography. Um, Okay, so state of the art. We said it's a state of the art and the future of photography. And I thought that was a very apropos um, term to use because, you know, if we read off of this, it refers to the highest level of innovation in any given field, right? It represents the pinnacle of progress and creation using the latest techniques, material, and knowledge to achieve something that was not possible before. That's exactly what we're talking about right now. All of this is around utilizing and being aware of and, and knowing and having a skill set around the latest technology, the latest abilities, the latest capabilities to allow you to do something that either others can or don't know how to do and making it more of a, a relevant and competitive. If, you're, if it's commercial aspect, it can be meaning, remaining competitive. But if it's a personal aspect, it also just means you can create things that were never before possible. And we'll be giving you demonstration after demonstration after demonstration of this. But this is all about keeping people state of the art, knowing what gear is the most advanced, knowing what software just came out uh, and, and keeping relevant in that space to inform you about what's creative and what's professional and everything in between. Um, so we wanna keep you state of the art. And here's our upcoming episode. So today is the introduction to AI, but there's so many wonderful topics we have explored a lot of, including the future of the camera, which will be our next session. That will be in I think two weeks from now, uh, but we'll talk about all the upcoming gear, how AI is being involved in cameras. We have AI of editing, photo editing, and Cliff is the master of editing. If you've ever uh, needed help with Lightroom, Photoshop, and neural filters, Cliff is the man. He'll be diving full-fledged into that. I did pay her to say that. No, no. Uh, text image generation, which is kind of my kind of world. I've been getting into mid-journey and all the other uh, stable diffusion and Dolly. We could talk about how we can create images through text. Uh, that is a big one. And I think when people think of AI, they think of that. So we're going to be diving headfirst and how to do that, what the different platforms are, and um, and how to really work those systems. Uh, we'll be talking about ethical considerations and challenges in AI in the next week, because uh, I think that's something to be thinking about when we're using text to image generation, you know, where are they getting the images from? Um, so something to consider when you would use these softwares. We'll talk about how to generate art and income. So new ways that this AI technology is introducing and entering into our world. And we'll talk about the future of sharing images because I think that's about to explode and change as well. So uh, we're going to dabble in all these little fields today, but just know that we may move fast, but we're going to actually have whole sessions diving into each one of these topics in the upcoming weeks and months. So consider this a bit of a teaser for the rest. And just like everything else in this space, it'll it'll evolve. Right. So we're actually going to be reaching out to the community and having you guys upvote or recommend topics or let us know what's more relevant. What do you want to see next? What do you want to see first? What do you really want us to dive into? Uh, and we're happy to, to bring that to you. So today we're going to talk about what is AI, how does it impact us, and where is it headed? So what is AI? Well. Okay, so if you just Google or Bing or you know, chat GBT, uh, now artificial intelligence, you're going to get a whole lot of meanings, but to really distill this down, because that's what we're trying to do here. Um, it's basically a term coined by Stanford professor, John McCarthy, basically saying that it's the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, right? Everything else is just the details 
of this, but it's a science and engineering of making intelligent machines, right? So what does that really mean? And how does that relate to us as photographers in the photo industry? Basically, it's allowing computers to do things traditionally required humans to do them, right? That is a concern right off the bat. It's something that requires humans to do, now computers can do. So it's like a red flag. Is that is it coming for our jobs, which we're going to do a whole presentation on? Mm -hmm. um, because the answer is maybe, right? <laughs> um, but that's a scary thing. And they're getting better and better and faster and faster and evolving extremely, extremely fast. And they are capable of doing things that traditionally humans would do. Um, also to make machines work more like humans think. And that's a really, really big part of this too. So when we talk about computers, it's nothing new that computers have been faster than us, right? Anyone who's used a, remember a, a, a T65 or T85 calculator? We have our old Casio watches. We have basic machines for decades, like the first calculators, think about, that are capable of doing things faster than us. So that's not new, but it was just computing. And that's the difference. It was just computing. Now it's capable of thinking like us. And that's the distinction here. That's why people are either excited or concerned or both. And they're right to be both, right? Because now they can do things faster, but they can also think and reason and logic. And that's where things start to change drastically from how things have done have been done before. So if we're going to briefly go over the history of AI, we'll know that if we look at this notable artificial intelligence system timeline, uh, the first digital computers happened in the late 1940s. We've had small innovations like a small robotic, robotic mouse could navigate a simple maze. That was pretty remarkable. And then in 1950s, we were able to have our first artificial neural network make a visual distinguish between cards that were either left side or right side. So the computer was actually able to make a distinguishing um, remark that it was either left or right. Then a, then a computer came out in the 1990s where the software learned to play backgammon at a high level just below human players. As we all know, um, computers are now beating humans at a lot of games like Go. Uh, yes. Chess. Uh, like a lot of these games, I mean, um, so, you know, that was in the 90s. Now we look at how far it's come. Uh, reaching the 2010, this was a pivotal year where deep learning systems and a neural network with many layers that could now recognize images such as dogs and humans. And of course, now artificial intelligence can understand language, has image recognition capabilities and are compatible that are compatible to that of the human. So as you can see, we can, we've done so much in less than a hundred years. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. And I remember almost to the day or to the week, I remember listening to a pod class last year. It was, I think it was Joe Rogan. And he was talking about the, um, the professor that was on there was talking about AI. And he said, in a year's time, which is now, the world will be a completely different place. There will not be anything that's left untouched with, with this new technology. No one even knew what was going on at the time. No one knew really what ChatGPT was until around this time last year. Um, and now it has. It's almost infiltrated just about every facet of our lives. And this is just the beginning. This is one year. This is the fastest growing technology in human history. right? And that is not being superfluous. At the time it was launched, at this time last year, it was the fastest growing technology in human history. And... We don't exactly know where this is headed. And so it's very, very, very important to stay on top of this. And that's what we're here to do. So just 10 years ago, no machine could reliably provide language or image recognition at a human level. And if you look at this chart, what it's saying is everything above the zero line is saying that the computers are actually beating the humans at a higher level. So as of now, there's going to be a lot of computers that are actually beating the humans in a lot of tests. So just something to be recognizing. <laughs> so basically, there's no turning back. <laughs> this is the chart equivalent of the genius out of the bottle, right? And we can either stick our, our neck in the sand or our head in the sand, or we can try and understand what really we're dealing with, you know, to the best of our abilities, because it will evolve and adapt on an ongoing basis. Um, not everything is about ChatGPT, but it's worth mentioning just for people who have like a just cursory understanding of this, um, because it did kick off a lot of things. And I think that might be the most um, impactful and yet maybe common household name as it refers to AI. Uh, but it's just one example. But what exactly is ChatGPT? I think like if you ask someone at a, at a, at a party or a restaurant or whatever in, in a group social environment, 
Do they know what ChatGPT is? Yeah. Do they know what it stands for though? Do they know what it really is? Probably not, right? So now you're going to know. Uh, I'm going to start from the bottom because it might make a little bit more sense to do so. So transformers. Um, it is not those robots that we see in the movies, but it's close to it. It's basically a neural network, and that's how our brains work. We have an organic neural network. The computers now are creating this mechanical neural network. And this neural network allows these nodes, these different points of data, just like our brains do, to organize and adapt and link in a million different ways, and then relink and relink. And I've heard someone a long time ago talk about that's all creativity truly is, is taking these data points and reconnecting them in different ways, right? And now computers are starting to do this. So it allows for what we call natural language, language prompts. Um, large language models is another term you'll probably hear recently if you haven't already. Basically, it, it works just like our brains do. Now, the pre-trained part is an interesting one too. Uh, basically, we have to feed data to these machine brains, right? To these transformers. Now, it just so happens to be that all of the world's knowledge is on this thing called the internet. So there's no shortage of data. Now, it's not trained on the whole internet. That can be tricky at times. And up until very recently, it's been only being trained on everything you know, prior to 2023, for instance. And now it's more up to date. Uh, but basically, you train on a very small subset, and it would only stay there for the initial stages. Then you can also train it on the entire internet. We don't really not, we're not going to talk about that yet. But what the most what the most interesting model is when you train it on a small subset, a pre-trained subset, and then you say, all right, take what you know about this, take what you know about this specific entity, and apply it to the rest of human knowledge on the internet, and then find those trends and interpolate those trends, and then generate information that's new, and that brings us to the last one the generative, right? That's what's so interesting about this. When we talk about computers, it's always been computing. It just takes the information we give it and does something with it faster. Now it's taking everything that we're not even giving it, right? It's taking a small subset, adapting it to everything, and then untrained, it's generating new information, images, video, content, media, text, copy, marketing, emails, everything. It's generating new content. And that is the crazy and scary and beautiful and wonderful and everything part of this. It's generating new content. So chat GBT. In essence, both train on human responses and answers to questions in a conversational format. So it basically allows you, and I was, I was speaking to my brother-in-law about this last night. He was saying, what's this presentation of? And I said, chat GBT. And he goes, I've never used it. What is it? And I was like, oh, okay, here we got a use case. Basically, and this is all I told them, picture all the world's human knowledge and all of human history on the internet. And the problem is you've always been scratching at this, right? When we when we put something in Google or Bing or something like that, we get just thousand results when what we really want is an answer. And now we can actually use this technology to put something into a machine to speak to it in a very natural way or natural language, and then have it give us an answer, not results, not just links, give us an answer to process all of human knowledge and give us an answer in a way that we understand it. So it interfaces with humans in a much different way than it has before. When was the last time you used Bing? You keep talking I, about Bing. I don't want to just talk about Google, you know, yeah, because unless they're going to sponsor like, it, um, Bing is, you, you'd you be surprised. You'd be surprised. Keep talking about uh, Microsoft is a, you know, is a, a significant, let's just say that. 49% uh, investor in this technology. So okay. that's why I felt it was relevant. Okay. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, there's ChatGPT4, which is a paid model, is actually in this newer version in in the Google, in Bing search. So just, just something to know about. Okay, right, moving, moving on. on, moving on. AI experts generally follow one of two schools of thoughts. Either they think AI will improve our lives enormously or they'll destroy us all. So let us know in the comments. Yeah, below. which ones do you guys think it's going to be? <laughs> I'm kind of teetering on both. I mean, sometimes I'm like, this is really good. And then I'm like, we're going to die. And experts, I'll, I'll point your attention to the word experts here. These are the biggest players in the industry. These are the people who are managing the companies that are developing technology as we speak. And these are their words saying this, <laughs> right? So this is something to take very seriously. This really is. Or not. 
So we're going to dive into the evolution of art. And here, you're going to notice that we did a lot of work with, I think this is Dali. Um, you'll notice we use Midjourney and Dali to generate our artwork here. So we're here we are using AI to create this presentation. And um, Or we could have spent a few weeks creating this first slide for you. It's okay. one of the two, <laughs> right? Um, so I, that's a good precursor too. You know, it's about if we want to convey an idea, forget about, you know, copyright, we're going to get into licensing and ethical concerns and all of that. But if you need to convey an idea, it's hard for me to even go back to thinking how I can create an image from scratch for every idea that I want to share in a presentation. I would never be able to convey what happens in my mind to everyone else in a very highly visual way. This is at our fingertips now. It's it's actually very effective to do it. Sure. Yeah. And this was just a couple of simple prompts where I said, show me the evolution of uh, art in a photorealistic way. So within 30 seconds, I had a sample like this. So Dolly is an amazing format. Is that a beer can at the bottom? Is that I think so. They're definitely okay, drinking. It looks like a 40. They're definitely drinking. Okay. It's part of All it. All right. So the evolution of art, this isn't something new. Art has always evolved and it always will continue to. So we're not we're not in this like very unique space in that regard. It's always been evolving, but how it's been evolving is what's different here, right? So a, a, a good analogy a lot of people use is the analogy to painting, right? And think about it. Painting's still around, by the way, right? Painting didn't go anywhere, but this was the primary form of visual communication of documentation at the time prior to around mid 1800 around 1840 or so roughly is when black and white photography came onto the market right so and then you have this transition you know it was quite drastic you have this whole new technology that was documenting reality not interpreting it and that can be open to discussion i'm not going to go there but you're basically documenting reality this lasted for about a hundred years black and white color paintings to black and white so if we're going to talk about the distinction between ai and analogizing this to painting it's not quite the same thing, right? Because about 100 years, even more so, about 130 years, photography was black and white where painting was color. And they coincided, they coexisted with each other, right? So then we have, well, painting to photography, right? And so now we have color photography coming to the market, realistically in a more commercial sense and wide application sense around the 1970s. Right. So about 130 years later, after this technology was developed, we're starting to get technology that can rival color in paintings and people taking this more seriously as, as an art form. But they did coexist, right? Yeah, but do you think the painters felt threatened by the photographers? Totally. And do you think that the painters went out of business because of photography? I don't know. I don't see that many painters anymore. I see a lot more photographers, but there still are painters. And I think secretly a lot of photographers are painters that just don't that don't have that skill set, which is kind of ironic if you think about it now, because coming full circle, we're going to talk about how we can get back into this idea of generating images rather than just what we call traditional photographs. We're getting back into this idea of painting, using it in an art form to create on a canvas again, and not necessarily necessarily using images and lens and light and sensors to create images. So it does sort of come full circle. All right. Then we get into film versus digital, another evolution, another revolution or an evolution or both. Right. And again, it's not necessarily the same thing. There's a lot of film photographers. I still know some film photographers out there. And a lot of the younger generation, I think, is going back into um, shooting film, too. Right. But it is an evolution. And there's been a lot of stress. There's been a lot of drama. I remember when we had four or five megapixel you know, digital cameras. And we were all waiting. And remember the debates that we had about, well, are you going to go digital? You know, and was it Joe McNally that did the first, you know, magazine cover on a digital camera and that transition? And it was always that debate. Do we want to do this? Do we want to do that? Are they coming for our jobs then? You know, what does this mean to photography? We've always been in this process of evolution. And I think there's always been a good job transition. Like obviously the people who ran the dark rooms when dark rooms weren't needed as much, they transitioned to doing editing. So I feel like you have to see what the changing times are and kind of learn to evolve. And I feel like we're kind of at another transition. Maybe, you know, the people who used to work uh, developing film, they kind of got put out of a job, but then they ended up doing something else in the field, maybe scanning and it's evolution, right? Or digital. Yeah, they exactly. Evolve. You can either evolve or you don't, or, or you just, I mean, I'm not going to throw any names out there like Kodak, 
all right? But you can either evolve or you don't. And that's a big part of this series is to keep you informed so that you can evolve. We're not taking the genie of the bottle here. We're not the ones making it rain. We're just the ones giving you an umbrella, right? Or a bucket so you can catch it, whichever you prefer. Sure. Protect yourself from it, catch it, um, but know about Dance it. In it. I Dance really in it. Dance in it. Enjoy it. Don't pretend that it's not there anymore. Know about it. And now here's our latest transition, digital photography to AI imaging. So I think it's kind of a very big jump. I mean, what the difference is between the whole evolution is we were always in the form of creating, and now we're creating in a way that we don't actually need any tools. Does that make anything different? I don't know. It's just, it's, it's different. And we chose the words here specifically, digital photography and AI imaging. They are different. I feel like people are conflating the two, right? And maybe I can understand why there's some overlap there. But photography, even if you look up the word photography, there's a lot of, this is something we never even needed to define before until this, this newer technology comes out. And you'll see in photography contests, go to your next, the next gallery, the next photo contest you try and submit and look at the rules. It'd be an interesting uh, endeavor or exercise to do. And let us know about it, right? Send us, send us an email. It'll say, a lot of them will say, it needs to be an image generated through capturing light on a sensor, right? They're trying to really distinctly define what it is to be a photograph versus an image. So we're choosing digital photography and AI imaging. You don't necessarily need a camera to create an image anymore. It's a really interesting concept. This is similar in evolution, but a very, very different process than anything we've seen before. And obviously there's the evolution of the camera, film to digital to now we're using computational photography in our cameras. And who even knows? I've actually been studying the evolution of a camera. There's a camera out that actually has no lens. You don't actually take a picture. You record what's happening in your current situation. And then you tell the camera, it's a, it's a digital kind of representation, what the scene looks like, and the camera will generate an image of what you're experiencing instead of you actually capturing the experience in front of you. So who the heck knows what the next camera will be? Do you need a camera to create an image? No. Right? I mean, that's really where it's coming down to. Maybe we should just title that. In fact, maybe that's what we'll title the next, because the next presentation we do um, will be on technology and advancements in technology as it relates to cameras specifically very appropriate for bnh right and you're talking to someone who makes a living on an iphone i, I travel all over the world shooting courses and creating content um, that gets distributed to a, a significant portion of the population based on how to leverage the latest advancement technology using the phone you have in your pocket right so this is a very relevant topic for me especially i'm looking forward to that the next one. We don't have all the time in the world to talk about all of it today, but we will dive into each one of these concepts a little bit more. So big surprise, we are already using AI in our camera, in our gear, in our editing. Just for those of you that are watching live or even those of you watching later, just look up Samsung S24. This was just announced in the last day or two. And every single announcement in the new technology of this camera, AI, 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 AI not AI, AI. 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 <laughs> That's saying that three times fast. If you look at the last CES show that just happened, you know, a few Everything weeks ago. Everything was AI. It's Everything is AI. I'm just go to YouTube and type in CES and everyone will just talk about AI, AI. There's AI bird feeders. There's an AI pillow. What? Yeah, it's it's ridiculous, AI right? Thing. So everything is AI, but AI has been in some format in our cameras. And we're going to talk about that more, but it's in a more significant way in our cameras currently. For instance, a new Sony is using AI. And you're going to start seeing this more and more as it is adapting a little bit. And, and there's that intelligence part of it, artificial intelligence, to intelligently understand what it is we're looking at. For the first time, we have cameras that understand what we're looking at. Think about the implications of that. It'll understand that there's a person in the scene and focus on their eyes. It'll understand if there's a dog in the scene. It'll focus on his eyes. And then you can choose which one. It'll do predictive focus, right? And we'll get into all the details later about this in, a, in the next episode. But it'll understand not just where the movement is now, but imagine a camera that can understand where that person is going to be next, right? And then predict the autofocus to make it more effective. Ultimately, all this really means is you get the shot that you want. We want the technology to, to be so sufficiently advanced that it just gets out of the way and lets us, in, a, in the most intuitive way possible, get from what our vision is to what we can create and share with others, right? And that's where the technology really does become quite handy to us. 
no pun intended, computational photography, right? Maybe I should take the slide too. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of this, but the world's most advanced phones are the ones that we carry with us all the time. The ones we have in our pockets, the iPhones, even the Android phones. Um, you know, if you say which one's better, just wait a few months, right? Something else will come along. Wait a few days. But basically it's allowing technology, allowing cameras to get around the physics of what it means to be a camera. So for instance, we'll talk about this more next presentation, but did you know when you open up a phone, for instance, it's already taking the photos for you. The second you open up the camera, roll. so when you press that shutter, it's already just recorded what it's already captured. And then at the speed of about 35 trillion, that is not a typo, trillion operations per second on a pixel by pixel level. And we're just getting started with this. It's manipulating, editing each one of those pixels to look perfect using AI to understand what that photo is about and comparing it to a database of billions or trillions of photos to understand, should I make that sky darker? Should I remove the noise here, but keep the texture over here? On and on and on, right? So that computational photography is going to trickle up, but the most advanced cameras are the ones that need it most, the ones with the smaller sensor, right? So a smaller sensor means that we have a little bit more noise. We can remove noise entirely with median noise, median stacking noise reduction, which happens in real time. Depth of field, right? Traditionally, it used to be about, and I've given presentations on this, we'd have more depth of field, which is good, but sometimes you want a shallow depth of field. They can get around that too with computational photography, right? In the latest generation of Lightroom, and we'll demo this in two sessions from now when we get to editing, we can throw that background out of focus afterwards with a more effective means so that we can say we want the nose and the eyes in focus, but not the ears. If you just get something in focus with a DSLR, think about that, you're stuck with that. We have on and on and on examples of how computational photography is going to shift the way that we capture images. It already has and it already will continue to. So we're going to dive in very briefly about what simple tools like AI and Lightroom can do. Like we have auto adjust. We've had this for a while now, right? I don't know how many of you guys actually use this. Use auto adjust. You adjust your picture. That was done with AI technology. Yeah. So we talked about, and we will continue to talk about in the next session, the state of art, the state of art and the future of photography as it relates to camera technology. Then we're going to talk about editing, right? And that is a like a total paradigm shift. I, I don't like using the word game changer, but it sort of is. I'm just going to say paradigm shift in how we approach not just editing, but photography. Because if you can take a photo, being more informed about what you can do in post, and you let that informed decision you make at the point you press the shutter, now you're taking like a whole nother level to your photography right there. And this is what I do on a daily basis with my students. And this is what we do in our workshops too. We show people how we can combine all the technology and the edit and the capture to create something that you had your vision for and do it in the most simple intuitive way possible. So yeah, to briefly go into Lightroom, we have auto adjust and that's basically using Adobe Sensei, which is their technology for AI. That's been out for a couple of years, but basically it's not just recovering the highlights and the shadows. It's going to understand what the photo is about and process it the way that other people, including you, process similar photos. That's a very, very different technology than just saying, look at the histogram or cover the highlights and shadows. And we can do this at import. So when I create the workflow for my students, I literally have it so when they, when they do one-click import, they put the memory card in, they hit one button, the computer takes over from there. It automatically pulls it up, puts it in the right year, month, day folder, backs it up in two different places, and auto adjusts the photo the way they want those photos to be adjusted all at the press of a button, right? So it's pretty advanced stuff right now and advanced to the point where it makes it simple. That's my kind of technology. The denoise. Did you talk about quick removal? It's quick removal tool. Um, it used to be in Lightroom that we had the, um, it was like a dust spec removal basically, right? Uh, and then we got a little bit better, but the problem is you always need to sample from other part of the image. Now that we have content aware, we don't have gen fill in here yet, the generative fill technology, but we do have content aware. So now it can just create the pixels for you and you can very easily intuitive without needing to go to Photoshop or anywhere else, remove objects or parts of the photo that you need to clean up. And it's really effective, way more effective than it ever has been. But speaking of effective, the denoise has been a, again, a total paradigm shift technology. That informs everything else we do from a camera standpoint, right? Now we can get away with micro four third sensors, APS-C crop sensors, extremely high ISOs, maybe lenses that are the F4 versus the 2.8 or the 5.6 versus the F4. 
because noise is a non-issue now. I'll go on record by saying this. Noise is a non-issue with this technology. Think about what that means for the decisions we make about the cameras we use and the settings we choose. I should write that down. The cameras we use, settings we choose. Um, this is the same photo. I put the information overlay on there so you can see it's the right. exact same photo. Um, total game changer. Here's another version. Here's another version. Hummingbirds are very challenging to shoot, especially in low light. So we were shooting at 128,000 ISO. And look at that noise. The one with the noise reduction is on the left on this side. And the one with the noise is on the right. Yeah. And we'll be posting some of these images up to that website as well so you can see them high resolution. I do understand that it's, it's compressed a little through Zoom. Another thing we want to talk about is briefly is AI in Lightroom with sub selecting your subject, object, and masking. I mean, this has been changing my workflow completely. So you can now select the person, you can select their face, you can select their eyes. This is kind of a goofy picture we picked, but you know, you don't even need to just select the subject. You could just like parts of the subject. And I know in the beginning we used to always go to Photoshop because that was the only place where you could do something like this. Doing it in Lightroom has changed my workflow so much because it just brings everything easier. And now you can do specific changes, modifications. So just affect the highlights on their face or just affect their hair color. You know, it's it's incredible what masking is. Yeah, done. the level of nuance that we have, right? And then the capability because we're in Lightroom still that we have access to that raw file is huge and allows us to accomplish what we need to do faster and quicker than ever before in a more intuitive way. So we don't have to think about how we're going to do something. We just find the skin tones and then do it and then move on, right? And then think about how that scales. So now we have adaptive presets. It'll take this technology that understands the subject, understands the sky, understands the background, understands the people. And you can say, I want to build a preset. And I always found it kind of funny how there are presets before because what applies to one photo doesn't necessarily apply to the other. That has all changed. Now we can buy presets that say, find the subject wherever it is. If you're a wedding or event photographer, if you're a professional making a living where time is money, even if it's your creator and you have a look that you want to generate, but unless that you know pesky subject stays perfectly still in every photo, you can shoot an entire event and say, find the person and adjust the skin tones every time. Find that sky in all the photos, make it a little bit darker, a little bit more dehaze in there until you get it down exactly what you want. And it will adapt to understanding where that sky and where the subject is on a photo by photo level that you can scale this. That is huge when you understand the implications of that. And then we have photo enhance. So it's a, a less known thing, but you can significantly enhance photos now. And this is just beginning. So this is actually a little bit of a cheat because I used another technology that Topaz used. So you can do up to a four times image resolution increase just by right-clicking on a photo in Lightroom and saying enhance. And again, we're going to do a whole presentation on this in two episodes from now. And I'll literally walk you through how to do this. But you can take any photo that you want, increase it 4x in a click of a button. If you want to go further, so I did this for a client of mine. We're shooting for the golf course out in uh, Arizona. They have a 1.5 megapixel image that they've taken that they've given me. And when I turned around, I showed them this. This is like something we see in the movies. And they're like, auto-resolve. And they find the license plate, you know, in the in the the crook or something like that that was getting away. Um, this is the technology that we have now. So we can significantly increase the resolution and the details and bring our old photos back to life. This is why I tell all my students, don't delete anything because you never know what we'll be able to do in the future. future. <laughs> we are in the future. <laughs> And AI and Photoshop has really stepped up this game too with generative fill. So now we're able to expand photos. Let's say you made it a vertical, but you really want to see what was on the sides. You can expand the sides. You can expand um, its places that you want to actually replicate. Do you have any? Yeah. This single technology has and will continue to change photography more than any other ad singular advancement in the history of photography. That's my personal opinion. It is a total shift in, in evolution. Uh, it's what's called the punctuated equilibrium. We talk about evolution, there's like slight little adjustments that go on for a long period of time. And then every now and again, if you look this up, there's a total shift in evolution. And this is that, that shift, a complete shift. It's not a common linear graduation. This is a punctuated equilibrium. So I have this photo in Venice, and this is the photo I wanted to get. This one in a workshop last year. Um, but this pesky dock, and there is, and I went back and forth and goggles. I wanted to get this photo, and there's no way I can do this with the perspective I wanted to get. 
So I have this vision and now in a couple clicks, we'll walk you through how to do this. Uh, we have a little bit more time in the next presentation. And also he added this guy. So a little bit more than just yeah. removing that, but he, he made the image the way he wanted it to be. So he removed the dock and added the sky. So a little bit of a sky replacement. Same with this image. I have this vision, another shot in Venice. I mean, up there at sunrise. I was like, oh, this would be a, this is the composition I wanted. This is the composition I had in mind, but there was this pesky dock. And you can't, you don't want to go in the water in Venice, by the way, pro tip, mm -hmm. right? So how am I going to get this shot? I'm utilizing my skills and technology and ability and understanding of what's available to me and framing up the shot the way I want it so I can create the image that I want to create. And you can see it's basically a seamless. And also removing people, which we're going and to And removing people too. I'm a less stressed photographer now when it comes to travel photography because people don't annoy me anymore. They just, I can remove them in a heartbeat. So let's talk about this picture real quick. And we're going to actually walk you through this whole scene on our editing uh, edition. But here, typical scene in Venice, we're at St. Marco's Square. And the problem is, there's a lot of people, and also because we're shooting with the wide angle lens, you get this parallel, the parallax. Yeah, the converging lines. Converging lines. Right. So it's not great. So what we do is we first change the orientation. Right. And you do this in Lightroom, by the way, and you'll find that when you do, and you should be doing this, you shoot wider than you need because you can control that distortion. Um, but then you're going to get these triangles, which doesn't look good, right? And the triangles are because there's no information there. Because you're really shifting the paper in perspective, yeah. right? Same thing, you're changing the perspective. So then we can use that technology to fill back in the gap, but also look what happened to those people. And look what happened to what was in front of San Marco. All that construction that was in this shot is gone. This was my vision. This is what we captured. And he got, he used the, removed the people with generative fill, just for the record. We used gen fill for that. Yeah. They didn't yeah. just magically disappear. No, but close to it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so when you do this enough, and I do this with my students, and like I just see the light bulbs popping all the time, it changes the way you see the world because you now can see through the creative constraints with another lens, that lens being your understanding of the technology available to you and your ability to use it to create the image and vision that you had in mind in the first place. Isn't that what art and photography is all about, right? Just so, one last example. So this is for a shoot we did in Sedona of a golf course. You know, uh, they said, can you get some of the people teeing off? But it just so happened, it was a very busy day. Lots of people were playing. You know, this wasn't the image that they wanted. So again, by using generative fill, we are able to remove the people and the distractions. So you're just really focusing on one subject. Now look at the pyramid of golf balls. You see that we can, and this took two seconds. This isn't something that was very complicated to do. I drew, I'll show you guys how to do this in, the, in a future episode, but essentially we're just creating a, um, a diagram of exactly the shape that we want it to build and it will do it right now. The implication of this is to me, like that's huge because if you're a professional photographer, that's being hired to deliver. You're not going to be there in perfect conditions. You're not going to be there on the perfect environment when no one's there. You can try and troll as much as you can, but if you're a professional, you're getting hired to deliver magic on demand. And that's where this technology really does come in handy. Forget about, well, if you know the ethics aside, and we're going to have a discussion about that on a professional commercial level, they're hiring you to deliver a service. And you should really know what's available to you and the technology available to you to get your job done. Neural filters, that is a fancy word that, a, that Adobe is using to put all the new technology that they're working on. Uh, if you go to filter and neural filters up in Photoshop, that's where it's kind of hidden and all the new features are in here. They're really cool ones. So I chose a stock image specifically, right? And we're gonna get into, I'll probably show you exactly how to edit this photo when we have a little bit more time in a future episode. But I chose a stock photo because one, I wanna show you how easy it is to get rid of it. Not because I want you to do it, because I want you to know how others can do it. That's really important. So that's the gen fill that's removing that. What did you, what did you... look at the, the stock, oh, right? The stock, so if you fair. have a logo, if you have a watermark, sure, sure. just that's so easy. That's and of course, people will be way. more impressed by the color. Well, I was going to get to that next, right? <laughs> that the color. Well, I was just going to get to that next. So the color, this is a black and white image. So I wanted you to choose a stock. I wanted to show you the stock photo too, because you know I'm not taking a color image and then making a black oh, and white okay. and putting it back to color. 
Think about all those old family photos. If you really want to like touch someone's heart, you want to make them cry, you make them really feel something, take an old family photo and do this. It'll take a minute of your time. I will show you how to do this. And even on our website, we'll be posting some content on there. It's so easy intuitive to do now. And there's a little trick that I'm going to show you during the next episode. It's a little bit of a precursor because it won't turn out perfectly, but we can match the colors. So you see the colors a little bit all over the place. I'll show you how we can paint the proper colors in. It gets us 90% of the way there. But take an old family photo, do this on it, and then send it to a loved one and see their reaction. And then talk to me and tell us and send us an email and post it on the website what that was like, what that experience was like for them. That's the power of photography. And just a close up, that's what this looks like. I did this for a picture of my parents when they were like in Rome back in the 70s. And my mom at first didn't recognize that it was any different than originally. Like, I guess she wasn't thinking that it was originally black and white. And I go, mom, was that the color of your dress? And she's like, actually, now that I look at it, it was green and not purple. So it's interesting that like, she just uh, like- she... That we can make the dress green, right? <laughs> exactly. But I mean, look at the resolution. I, I put the information overlay on here too, from two megapixels to 43. We can print large with this. It's not an issue anymore. Any print size, noise, sharpness, Anything is not an issue anymore. Color, black and white. What we can do to our old photos to bring those, those family heirlooms back to life again. And we're just getting started. When I talk about life, there's whole new technology. We don't have time to get into now. That will literally bring these things back to life. Create it in three dimensions. Create perspective. Animate with motion. Put breeze in the, in the branches behind. It's wild. But from a very significant, meaningful way, you can do this right now. And it's a very practical and meaningful application to using your photography. So the remove tool. The remove tool is basically generative fill in a brush, right? Mm -hmm. So just know what's there. What I do for my students is I take the most important tools, the object, um, the object choosing tool. I'll show you that in a second, the object tool. And then also the remove tool. And a couple of the tools, I put them right at the, the top of their toolbar. So when they go into Photoshop, they already know what tools are the best tools available to you. Right, and just simplify us because I wish Adobe did this by default. Um, but it's a really powerful tool. The object selection tool is another one I put at the top there. Uh, I put a little video together just to show you what that looks like. And this is something we'll demo in a future episode. Um, but essentially, you just hover your cursor over the object that you want to select. So selections and the issues around making complicated selections are a thing of the past. Right, And your time is the most precious and valuable thing you ever own. And so this will save you time, right? That is extremely valuable to do this. And so you can take an image like that and quickly get from there to there. But in a little bit of a blue sky at the top, just remove that distraction and you can really concentrate on the vision that you had. Spot healing. Yeah, spot healing makes a big difference when you're trying to remove those dust spots or you're trying to remove something you don't like or wanted in your picture. Yep. Um, you can even copy and clone it. And it just happens at a click, it right? It's AI. been around for a few years, but I want to mention it because it's still very helpful and valuable to just get rid of all those little things. So this is a whole other session on editing tools with AI using Topaz Lab. So Topaz is this whole series of gigapixels, noise reduction, sharpening. I mean, we could talk about Topaz all day. Portrait Pro is great if you want to do any face softening. Imaging is great for culling and actually for um, more like uh, culling and um, selection, editing, actually group editing. Sorry, it took me a minute to remember which is which. Uh, group edit, batch editing. So like if you're a wedding photographer, you want to do some batch edits, imaging is a way to go. After shoot does the same thing. Luminar, Neo, incredible things that Cliff was talking about. Lenza sure. is if you want to make your own portraits look like you are an elf from Lord of the Rings. And these are just a few of the examples. We'll be posting more on our website, all the recommended tools, and you know a little bit of a brief summary on that. Um, so each one of so these for that, but we'll be making are recommendations. Amazing. So we'll yeah. we'll kind of dive into them a little bit more in our future presentation. Exactly. Exactly. As well as text to images, I know we kind of showed you a lot of the work that we've created with Dolly and Mid Journey, but we want to show you how to do it, start to finish. Also, use Stable Diffusion, Adobe, Adobe Firefly, which you guys all have. If you have Adobe products, you could be generating your own images right now. And that's also great software because it's conscious of being, um, of, of using images that are not um, stolen. 
They're, yeah. they're using copyright free images. So if you want to pick a better way to source your images, if you're going to use text to image generations, check out Adobe Firefly. And then also Runway is great for creating your own um, text to video. I mean, who even knew that would be possible? So I haven't gotten too far in that one, but it's something I look forward to exploring with you guys, but how we can create text to video. And text to speech. There's a whole nother level. So we're going to dedicate like a full series, a full podcast just to this, and most likely more than one as we demonstrate how to use this. This is just telling you what's available, right? This is just an overview. We'll be showing you how to use these tools, demonstrating them, comparing them, Right. And we'll be taking that offline as well, you know, on that future, the future of dot photography website. So we can, you know, spend a little bit more time and really demonstrate this view and then challenge you guys to upload some of your content and then build that community from there as well. Well, how does this impact us? So I think we could think about it in a positive way. It's creating advancements in our equipment. As you can see, AI is built in. If you look at even smartphones with computational photography, they're even like editing when you take the picture. Like if you ever look at how great your images look on the back of your smartphone, they're already doing what you think you want to see in it. Like Adobe has a secret sauce or Apple actually has a secret sauce that they put into your phone that it brightens the shadows. It does HDR. It, it makes your pictures look great. So you don't even need to edit them most of the times. So with AI, the advancements are happening already in the equipment. Is that good or is that bad? I think it has been. All right. It reminds me of that analogy of that, you know, there's a, a, a famous saying where he talks about, oh, I broke my leg. It was, it was good or it was bad. But then they're recruiting for war. Oh, so it was good. But then they did this and it was bad. You don't quite know whether it's good or it's bad. It's just, it's there, right? So advancement equipment, we talk about the democratization of tools used to create images. Is that good or bad? A lot of people say, well, then now everyone's my competition. The kid out of high school is going to take jobs to me. Sure. But what that also means is people are going to be evaluated based upon their vision and their creativity, not on their ability to use the gear. And I think overall, the cream will rise to the top and that will elevate all of photography, all of creativity, when in, when we get to the point which we already are, right? Anyone can get their hands on a creative tool to create images now. What are we gonna say? We focus less on how to say it. We focus more on what it is we wanna say. So automation and post-processing. I mean, I welcome this. Yeah, totally. <laughs> if, if there's anything I could do less of, it would be post-processing. I have years yeah. worth of pictures I haven't even looked at from all our travels. If I could just say, hey, can you give me the best travel photos? Can you stack those HDRs? Can you build those panos? Can you make them all perfectly perfect? And then can you post them on Instagram for me? Create a hashtag and um, also like a little blurb that gets more people to look at my content. I think and guess what? We can. That's all possible. We can. Crazy. This is what I do on a daily basis. This is my boot camps or the photo retreat we're doing later this year. We're going to spend a week in Sedona just going through, shooting in the mornings and the afternoons, editing, building portfolios, automating everything, and walking away with like a workflow that you can take for the rest of your career, right? I usually do this in two days, but then we're going to extend this on location to, to make it just a little bit more fun. Um, but the automation is here. And it will completely transform your photography. Also can assess with assist with the creative process, like thinking through your pictures. So, I mean, I've gone to um, go to mid journey, Google a couple ideas and get some visual ideas of how I can create some new lighting effects for my next pictures. Um, it can help me generate new ideas. I think it's, it's really inspiring. Yeah, we were on location shooting Manly Lake in Death Valley. Right? And we had a model out there. We had that lake that was formed from once every 10 year storm. And then we were thinking, well, what are some creative ideas? And we took to text to image technology. We went to ChatGPT and Dolly and Midger and a few others. And we were just looking for, like we had our model that was a circus performer. She dressed up. We were like, what visions can we create? And it was really helpful to see something that made me think about how can we recreate that in reality on location with our tools? It was a really interesting challenge to be able to do. So it does give you some creative direction. Also improved image quality, which we're already seeing with the higher megapixel and AI also fixing noise and just making image quality look better. Streamlining, stream, well, streamlining routine tasks. Who doesn't want that? I do. Personalizing your photography. So if you have a distinct style that you want actually to have all your pictures look like, AI can help you with that by helping you with the post-production workflow. 
And it can also generate models and scenes that maybe you could never have taken. So let's say you've always dreamt of going somewhere and you dreamt of having a model there. You can actually create that picture using text to picture. Uh, or think about a client with limited production costs, you know, and I want a shot of the hero CEO, like, and he's a big football fan, put him in a stadium, put him on the edge of a mountain. All right, well, now we got to get plane tickets. We've got to clear a schedule for three days. We've got to get him out on location. We have to do all these things. We have to make sure, you know, the weather. Now you can create the images that you want to create from a personal professional level using AI in a very real way, in a very intuitive way. And it's not that that couldn't be done before, but it's very difficult. And now that happens in seconds. And you can make that a part of your process to keep you competitive. Right. That's really important. And we will be showing you how to do this in future episodes. So some of the challenges and concerns are that there's a lack of personal touch and creativity in the editing process. Hey, if your um, computer's doing all the work and maybe you don't really have your own fingerprints in it, then maybe it's a little bit lax. These are all topics we'll be covering more of. Job displacement is a huge thing that we're thinking about. Will AI automate the process and re reducing the need for human in intervention? Maybe. Yeah, we're going to do a whole dedicated series to that. The risk of over-reliance on AI. I know I'm becoming reliant. Seriously. <laughs> I know. Not just AI. I mean, technology in general, right? If you ever try and get somewhere, I even went out to dinner the other night and my, my phone ran out of juice. And I was like, do I even know how to get back? Yeah. <laughs> so line. Raises of ethical dilemmas relating to the authenticity of visual content, deep fakes, privacy concerns, and potential misuse. Now, this is a mouthful and it is a huge concern of ours. So we'd like to dive into, you know, what are we doing? What can we do about it? You know, there are a lot of steps that are being taken as we speak, and there will be measures taken as this develops in tandem. And that's a it's a very real issue and concern from the top level of the companies that are developing this technology. So it's important to stay on top of this, too, because that does affect all of us on a very serious level. AI requires significant computing power and concerns exist regarding the environmental impact of large scale. I agree. I mean, I feel like I've read a lot of articles about how all these computers are taking up so much power, even for dumb things that I'm asking. Like, you know, I ask silly questions yeah. on chat GPT all yeah. the time. And I think about, am I killing the planet with these silly questions? So it's something you're going to hear more about, about basically the carbon footprint of our technology, which is something we don't consider. Um, because it's not it's not publicly available some of that information, um, these giant computer clusters are taking up a lot of power, a lot of energy, a lot of resources that isn't really mainstream yet. But you will hear about hear about this more. So what is real anymore? And I'd love to ask you guys: Who do you think is real, and who do you think is computer anim uh, created? So one of these is real, and two of them are computer animated or computer generated. Uh, We're gonna pause for dramatic effect. But because the, the time, <laughs> because we are running, we only have a few minutes here. Uh, so the truth is, I think they're all computer AI. They are. Yeah. They are. All of these are, they're all computer generated images. And it's one thing to say this in a presentation going through Zoom, but there's been studies time and time and time again to photographers, right? Forget about fooling the general public. That's actually quite easy to do. Photographers are the ones I will... Ooh, let me see where the lighting source is. Let me see the catch lights in their eyes, right? Let me analyze this and see what, you know, is this real? Is this not? Photographers, historically and statistically, cannot tell a difference. That's the level we're at now, let alone a year or two from now, right? So really, what is real anymore? And forget about us asking this question. What about the, I've, I've heard one photographer call it the photographic hell. Mm -hmm. When everyone else is questioning everything we do, is this real? Is this real? This is going to be a question that will follow almost every image that you post, that you share. Was this real? Was this real? Get used to it. That's a really scary thing to consider, right? So we are working, not us personally, but where there's technology being developed that will help authenticate whether something is real or not. And it'll be a cat and mouse game a little bit, you know, um, whether you'll be able to get around it, but that's a very real concern. And we're already there. So what does the future of photography look like? And, you know, this is a generated picture I got from um, Mid Journey. And it was, I typed in future photography, what do future photographers look like? This is some of the images it gave us. And hopefully we don't look like this. I was actually hoping for smaller gear, kind of like this. This is what I hope the future of photography looks like. Cool <laughs> glasses, really sporty outfits, and uh, small cameras is, is what I'm hoping. But 
really, what does the future of photography look like? And it, it's still undetermined. I... To me, it's kind of funny how they still show cameras looking how they look. Right. You have all like you have these lenses in your goggles, which we I already have the Apple Vision on order. Um, that'll be very fascinating. We're actually going to talk about that in another episode about how the future of sharing our images. But they have the capability of taking the photos. My idea of a future of a camera, we're going to start the conversation next episode, is what does the camera future actually look like? For me, it's not, it's something that I don't want to have to hold in my hand. Mm. Right? I don't want to hold and carry. It's actually going to be right on my eyelid. I, I want it to that. just get out of the way, the process entirely. So it's kind of funny that they're holding cameras, but they have those those lenses on there. So um, briefly, we're going to review the future of photography and how it affects careers. So head and we'll do a whole episode on this too. Right. And we'll get into it. Either. So headshot photographers, we just want to say heads up. We were able to create these new headshots by using an app called Headshot Pro. And just by sending in 10 images of ourselves. Yeah. And I mean, there's plenty more that are plenty more. And they're not perfect. Let's be real. But they were good enough for, I mean, for people who don't care about headshots as much as I do. And by the end of this recording, they will be good enough. <laughs> know, right. Probably. <laughs> um, product photography. I think you're in some hot water um, because, I mean, it's easy to replicate products. So think about if you have a product, a shampoo bottle or something like that, or a beer can or a pair of sneakers. If you can generate an object and light it any which way you want, anytime, and they say, oh, we got this new color out. We got this. Let's call the photographer and bring him back into the studio to light it exactly the same way. And I've done this before. And we have to use a you know an X-ray color chart to match the exact specific color tone for that branded you know hex key color. They can generate this now, and businesses are going to do what makes them the most money or helps them save the most money. That's a that's an obligation that they have a fiduciary relationship to their to their their base, their supporters. So it's nothing to take personal, but it's something to be really um, considering on is what that looks like and stay on top of that. Commercial photographers, right? It's the same idea. Like we showed you before, we were shooting for the golf course. We shoot for, for different, uh, resorts. We shoot for all these different organizations. Um, you need to understand this technology and how best to use it to keep you competitive. Because if you're not, and I heard a great quote, they're saying AI isn't going to take our jobs away, but other photographers using AI, will take our jobs away. So if you are not using it, and I'm not talking about just AI specifically, I'm talking about all the technology made available to us. It's very important now to stay on top of these things because it's not necessarily that the computers will come for our jobs, but other people who do know how to use the technology will be coming for your jobs because they can do it at half the cost and twice the speed and keep it more competitive so the price point will be lowered. So it's about more scale. And it's not something that you know we have a say in, the only thing that we have a say in is, is our understanding of this and of our process and, and becoming more aware of this. Wedding photographers, I feel like your job is pretty safe because everybody wants to capture the authenticity of their day. So I feel like you can't replicate that, but your job could get easier with some AI technology, some AI calling. Photojournalism, I also feel like we have to capture real moments. I think you're in the clear as well. We, we have to kind of find a way to make sure we can validate photojournalism photos are real too. So we're working on that. I think technology is working on that so we can not have deep fakes or fake images. But I think that's kind of a career pool where, again, you're trying to capture moments that are authentic and actually really happening. Sports photography also has the same thing. You still want to capture those real moments. I really think that um, this might be the golden age for photojournalism in a lot of regards. So there could be a significant push back to the authentic the real, the as is, the untouched, the decisive moment, all of that, I think there could be like a rubber band effect as people are so used to just everything generated that it doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't matter anymore. Everything just looks so good and that people will crave authenticity, mm -hmm. right? And photojournalism that could really significantly impact in a positive way uh, if and when that, that's true. So what are our predictions? Well, I am at, I predict that integration of AI into camera and editing will continue and flourish. I feel like it's already happening in smartphones and all the newest phones um, are coming out with AI built into it. Yeah. So if you just see the latest announcements on the cameras with the um, quickest turnaround time, so at the development times, which are the phones, they're, all of their presentations now, all their keynotes are all around the technology for the cameras. 
And now that AI is the genius out of that bottle. And we just saw that our first taste of this a couple of days ago with that new Samsung model, trying to brand themselves as the AI based phone. Wait for Google, wait for Apple to come out with their versions of this. It is going to be infused in literally everything we do. And we are going to see this trickle up. We better see this trickle up because at the moment, and this isn't going to happen for very long, we're going to talk about this more next episode. We don't have any interchangeable lenses that are significantly leveraging AI to capture photos in a more intuitive and realistic way at the moment. We see some Micro Four Thirds, the OM system, and some others, um, but not in a significant way, heavily based on computational photography that we see on our phones. I'm excited to see so when that becomes a reality. Immersive 360 photography. So this is with the Apple uh, Vision, Vision Pro, Vision Pro yeah. coming out. I mean, I think that could be something we all turn our heads to do. Like 360 photography, we have these special goggles. We can experience photography in a different way. I think it's- This a, is a sleeper. Future. I'm excited to do that presentation just on how we share images, what that looks like. We've been handicapped since the dawn of photography. We live in a three-dimensional world, four dimensions we capture time, which is a very relevant concept for photography if you think about it. But if you stick with three spatial dimensions for the second, we're stuck. We think about prints. We think about a two-dimensional print. And we're using our screens not to their full potential. We're not using it in the fourth dimension of time to add a little bit of motion here and there. But now, for the first time, we're just this is a sleeper. We're going to have technology that will allow us to take the uh, the creative restraints around a small screen and portability. People want a bigger screen, but something less to carry and have any screen size we want and then introduce depth. So three dimensionality, because when we have screens, it's kind of ironic because back in the eighties, we had those stereoscopic little lenses. Think about that on a mass scale when, in, when that happens, we're right at the early adoption stage, but we'll be able to spatially create images and think about the impact that that will have when you can capture an image or a scene in three dimensions, in three dimensions, and then share it to someone, have them experience a photo, not look at it flattened on a two-dimensional screen, but experience a photo. That is an absolute monumental shift, and that's just becoming reality. With some of these goggles now, we're going to see where that technology develops. It's right in the beta stage, um, but I'm really excited to see where that goes to help us immersively experience photos. I think AI content creation is just going to reach new levels meaning using mid-journey and other types of content that we're just creating with AI. Yep, absolutely. AI-powered learning. I think we're all going to learn a lot. There's going to be new learning tools that we can learn with the power of AI. Totally. And we're going to focus on realism and authentic moments. Like Cliff said with photojournalism, I think there's going to be a movement where people kind of get bored of these images that are perfect and too good looking. And you just feel like everything's fake and they're going to want to go back to those authentic moments, those real moments. And I'm hoping that people still continue to do photography as we do so nowadays. Photography is here to stay. Yeah. It really is. That degree to which that happens, we you know that, that, is, that story has yet to be uh, told or unfold. But it's unfolding as we speak. So as we talk about how we're going to move forward in this, and we want to encourage you guys to do this, let's talk about evolving. Let's evolve with the creative vision. Continue to have that creative vision because AI can't replace creative visions. That's the one distinct thing that is uniquely human, is that creative vision. And it will, in, in one way or another, force us almost, whether it's kicking or screaming or just running towards the light, to focus almost like like laser focused on creative vision, right? That will distinguish you from everyone else. Personal connection is something AI can't do. We can do that. You can do that. If you create that personal connection, it's irreplaceable. So do that. And with wedding and event photographers, capturing that moment is, is everything, right? So it won't replace that either. Creating an experience. I mean, that's what Cliff and I do in our workshops too. It's not just about taking pictures. It's about creating an experience that people will always remember and always cherish with them. So if you're a portrait photographer, or even an event photographer, be a part of that experience. And then what about, we should have wrote this down too, having an experience. That's true. That's the best reason to go grab a camera in the first place. It gives a perfect excuse to go sit on that beach at sunrise, to climb up that mountain, to see that view at sunset, to introduce yourself to that stranger across the tree and say, hey, I love that hat. Do you mind if I take a photo? That experience, the camera is a perfect tool. That will never get taken away from us. It doesn't have to be about the saleability or competitive advantage. That experience of capturing a photo and using that little device in your hand to more deeply um, engage with the world around you is 
paramount to this and that will never change. Truth and storytelling, that is the nature of photography. And I hope it continues to be that way. That is why I took my camera up and I wanted to capture moments and tell stories. So continue to evolve and tell stories with your camera. We're in photography culture and context. Yeah, I mean, everything is going to change, right? The culture is changing as we speak and the context in which we capture it as well. Um, but there's always going to be this, this drive and need to, to capture this culture, right? And I don't think technology is going to just generate that. That's something that needs to be documented. And the culture around photography, too, is going to shift. And I'm, I'm very curious to see what that is going to look like. Again, the ethical and moral judgments, be kind. Think about what you're doing here. Don't just blindly start using software. You don't understand where the images are coming from. Be aware. And we might not even be aware of what we're doing yet. We don't understand the implications of what it means to just generate something, right? That's what a big part of this series is about, is having those discussions, those hard conversations about what that looks like, and to be aware of that and to facilitate that conversation. So I want to hear from you guys about what that looks like, what's ethical, what's not, because we're all going to be building this road as we drive it from here on in. And lastly, I challenge you to evolve and expand your creativity with AI. Use it, try it, learn it, explore with it, and then grow with it and, and work it into your workflow. Evolve with it. Evolve. Awesome. So we want to thank you guys for joining us today again. And I recommend that all of you guys uh, go to the future of that photography uh, to sign up for our newsletter so you guys can get all the information. We actually created a whole page where we share all the information that we're finding and we find interesting so we can share it with you guys and you guys can read about it too, whether it's YouTube videos or newsletters that other um, creators are creating. So in the process of creating this where it will serve as a resource. So we'll be posting some articles, all the relevant news as it relates to technology and photography. Um, just some videos that we love. I think it's important for people sure. to see and then have a community around us. I want to hear from you guys. I want to know what you want to learn, what problems you're having, what you know concerns you're, you're facing. Uh, and I want to see your photos and what you guys are creating as well and be able to share that with each other. So rather than waiting from one episode to the next, we'll be, be able to take this offline a little bit and, and create a little bit more of a community with us. And lastly, if you want to join us on location, we'll be traveling. Oh, yeah all over this world. Yeah. I uh, will be in Death Valley uh, this spring. Yeah. So if you want to come join us in March in Death Valley. Or the Super Bloom. Yeah. It's the Super Bloom, hopefully. The Dolomites, Switzerland, Trona Pinnacles, Alabama Hills, Sedona, you know, Mexico. So, this is about the experience. This it, is what we call them. They're experiences of photography. I truly believe, like from my core, the greatest photos are the product of the greatest experiences. And so nothing is ever going to replace it. All this AI taking our favorite people out on location and creating amazing experience with them. Those are memories of a lifetime. Totally. Um, so that's just another another aspect of what we do that uh, I'm always look forward to the most, actually. Okay, that wraps it up for this week. <laughs> oh, happy! Oh my God, there's a panda in this space. We've thought about doing this. We're like, no, that'll be too distracting. That is great. I, I'm too that's immature. AI use at its best. I'm just uh, trying out AI. You're evolving. <laughs> I I'm love a, it. You're evolving. <laughs> I've already evolved. How do I? How do I get rid of this thing? There we go. I love it. Sorry. So good. Twelve years old, really. That was great. That was a ton of information. You guys don't even need a series like that. You should have just kept going. I mean, we you just need another uh, few days. We got enough. There you coffee. go. Yeah. Look, bring us some more coffee. <laughs> there you go. I need coffee as well, and we'll open it up for we. We have time for some Q and A. I want to thank you guys for for staying with us. Um, I, I want to start it off with a question blending, like I've done the Photoshop thing, which not even going to go into it. Cause I think it's like a, it's, it's like a split down the middle of the people who are like, Oh, photo, the Photoshop AI is great. Or Photoshop AI is not, it's definitely not like the other platforms, like the Dolly mid journey, all of that. Can you add, can mm. like, can you use your photos with Dolly mid journey, all that? other generative AI stuff, is there any blending, any hybrid way, or is it just prompt? It spits something out. Two different things, two different scenarios, two different technologies, right? So the gen fill in Photoshop, that's what we're referring to. I really wish they call that gen remove. I want to relabel that gen remove because I think it's way more interesting to remove distracting telephone poles and objects. And what's interesting about that is when you really, do you ever look at a picture later and when you get back from a travel trip or whatever, and you're like, 
I totally didn't even see that like beer bottle that was down there. I didn't see that telephone pole. There's something so distracting you didn't see it because we don't see with our eyes, we see with our minds. So we have very selective focus, right? Um, so I don't have an issue unless it's being submitted, you know, we can get into the weeds about that for photojournalism, whatever, to remove these distractions because it is more likely that you really didn't see those distractions while you're focusing on that perfect person walking down the street, even looking at the power lines above, right? So I like to use it as a more general move, like 90% of the time. Can you add stuff to it? Can you fill with it? Sure. Can you put a little, you know, a golden retriever walking down the street next to the person you could? But to me, that doesn't, that doesn't like fill my creative soul. But from a commercial standpoint, there it's under it's it's important to understand that you can. From the text and image generators, it's not easy to do that what you're asking now. And I know a lot of people are asking about that, right? Can we put in our own photo and adapt it? The answer is yes but it's not as intuitive as you think at first. You can now at the moment, the Adobe Firefly, for instance, you can use your photo as a reference for a style and for a color and, a, and an aesthetic tone to it, and then generate new content from there. Um, but to, to, to take your face, for instance, put it on a Superman body and stuff like that, there's dedicated software that will do that. But we're, we're one generation away from the text and image generators on a mass scale from being able to adapt your photo directly and the time being, we bring it into Photoshop, we do what we want to do, and we can use the specific applications depending on what it is we want to accomplish. And you can do it if you knew a little bit more, if you wanted to geek out a little bit, but for like the mass market, for the Dolly, for Stable Diffusion, for uh, Mid Journey, you're not there at the moment, but maybe by the time you know, you're know you watching this, <laughs> it will be. All right, good. So I'm not missing anything then. When you said generative AI removal, I'm like, yeah, it's great. It's great for removal. It replaces clone yeah. stamping and a lot of the the lasso and, and removal tools that they've had, the healing brushes. So it saves right. you time. It's not doing anything yeah. you couldn't do before. It's just you can actually do it and have dinner and sleep, all of those things now at the same, <laughs> you know. Um it, it why would we waste think about it, how much time we've wasted, you know, trying yeah. to make perfect mask. mask. Yeah, and now it's like me. done in a heartbeat. I know. And if you know that, I know intuitive it is it will change how you shoot. Don't worry about, you don't need to critically expose to the shadows. You, you, you expose to the shadows knowing that the highlight's gonna blow out, but you can put in that sky or capture it and blend in them later, or you, you're, you're thinking through the process, right? But you can't think through the process unless you've seen it, right? I can't tell you how delicious a banana smoothie is if you never tasted a banana. You have to see it and you're like, oh yeah, I know this will be good. I'm gonna add a banana to the smoothie now. And I think that's yeah, the right analogy, approach to have. We don't make smoothies every day. It's part of a <laughs> junk free January for me. I'm a smoothie person, so I, I respect that. I, I think that it is that's that's the right approach. Is everyone gets scared or everyone's like, like I love the the topic of conversation. I like, are we gonna lose our jobs? And it's like, well, you might. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lose my job. Like, no, I'm gonna use AI. Like I, I perfect example. I use AI on my images and I use the Adobe, whatever, the generative fill, remove, whatever, to storyboard and to say, you know, like I had, I used it on an image for a while while planning out a shoot for an album cover to yeah. show the client potential. Hey, this is what it would look like in a library. This is what it would look like in here. This is what it would look like here, there. Yeah. And was able, you know, he was able to, once he got over the, okay, this is just a rough representation, just to give you an idea. It was more of like a, oh, hey, I love this color palette that it spit out here. That's a color palette I want to use. And so it was good for like putting things together, not in a direct way. I was using it just literally as like a behind the scenes planning tool for a shoot that I was then going to execute. But AI gave me the ideas in a split second of the time that it would take me to sit there and try to generate and draw up and look up pictures and go on Pinterest and all that. And it's like, no, I could just type something in and use it. That's the slippery slope right there. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. right? There, oh, this is helping me actually facilitate communication with my client and generate ideas. This is a good thing. It's helping me deliver a product and, and you know, reference it so I know what to do when I get on location. I know I have approval from client, all these things that are good. But what happens when it gets so good? They're like, well, why don't we just use that? Why do we even need to go to the studio? Why do we need to order those things? Why do we have to get the model? That's coming. It's already here. And all of a sudden, that's a slippery slope. Well, why don't we just generate the whole thing? You can generate it for a vision. I like that vision. Can I just use this? And it's so 
it, it is, you know, we're playing with fire a little bit here and no one truly understands where that lies. And it has to do a lot with what the clients think. If the clients are okay with that, which honestly, a lot of it from a commercial standpoint, not all this commercial, but from right. a commercial standpoint, if they're okay with that, you know, if it's a band image and they're like, oh, put us on this amazing stadium. Okay. We can either rent the stadium out for $10,000 an hour, or we can just put a backdrop in there for you. Right. You know, and if I can do it and someone else can do it because it's so easy, well, they hire a very skilled professional photographer that can light this, that can do this, that can produce this shoot, would they? Right. And that's a it's a conversation that like we were having on a very real basis on an ongoing like day to day thing. There was a meme on, of course, there's a meme for everything uh, on that I saw going around on Instagram that kind of summed it up perfectly. And it was like it was a, like a creative like a graphic design meme. And it was like the client is still going to have to be able to say what they want. And that's always been the thing is like, you know, with, especially with graphic design, it's like the client doesn't know what they want. You have to tell them and you have to give them ideas and you have to show them examples. And I think that kind of translates perfectly to the AI thing. That's why prompt it's writing idea generators, which is true. Like, yeah, it doesn't spit just out ideas. We have to actually prompt it. So no ideas will ever happen if we don't put those seed in. So in the end, the creativity still lies with us. The idea makers. Henry Henry Ford is famous for saying, if you ask the public what they want, they'll just ask for more horses. Yeah. All right, this is when he invented <laughs> the car. If you ask the public what they want, they'll say more horses. Um, that is our job and responsibility. Um, but it is very murky waters. You know, we don't pretend to have those those answers there. That's more of that's more of a discussion to be had rather than answers to be given around that topic as it evolves. Well, this is my time to shine for all those people that are like, what the hell goes on in your head? Like, how do you come up with this? Like, <laughs> maybe my future is in prompt writing. Yeah, uh, exactly. There we go. <laughs> Stay yeah. tuned. Don't let me learn this. <laughs> well, guys, I want to thank you. No questions, just hugs and fabulous presentation. Love you guys. So we had Sandy on Vimeo, Becky on Vimeo, oh. send in love. So Yay. it's always good. Thank when you, Becky. When you get the thank you, Sandy. Look, awesome. you guys are going to be back. It's this is going to be this is going to be an ongoing thing. I'm super excited to see where this goes because, like I said, I'm I'm very interested in it. I just can't commit the time, so it's going to be easier to let you guys kind of just guide, and then I like host I said, this the damn first... show so I can ask there all the questions go. I want. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and then we'll put the whole thing on autopilot. We don't even need to show up anymore. It'll just be the the chat bot talking to you guys i'm yeah. wondering at what point it's what point are we going to hit that where it's, it's yeah you guys are it's going to be empty I chairs i have complete yeah. avatars yeah just, exactly just summarize it for me <laughs> there we go well look i'm going to let you guys go because i know we've we probably overextended our welcome here but i already have a ton more questions going forward just based on what you guys have showed us today but i'm going to table that for the next time uh, we did drop in the chat there for all of you who are watching online uh the next episode of this i believe on february 12th so stay tuned for the series a huge thank you to cliff and susan for joining us and discussing this wildly exciting there we go just got the link there um format so huge thank you to you guys we'll, we'll see you back around to everybody out there watching on the interwebs of course check out our youtube page this is where this and all of our other live content remains archived so you guys can learn for free which is what we do here in the bnh event space cliff susan thank you again me we'll too. see you guys on the 12th and uh, see what you have for us. Can't Looking wait. forward to it. Sounds Thank good. You. That's it. Another round of the BNH virtual event space now in the books. Catch y'all next time.